Would you pray with me? Lord God, we give you thanks for this good day. And we thank you for your word and the life that it brings and the encouragement that it is to us. As we turn to you to hear from your word, Lord, bless my words that you may speak through them. Bless all our minds that you would think through them and illuminate them. And bless our hearts to be open to receive from you the gift of your Holy Spirit. In the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. You may be seated. We're now in the season after Pentecost. It's the longest season of the church here, which is often called ordinary time. It's called that because we focus on what it means to follow Jesus in our everyday, ordinary lives. What does it mean for us, you and I, to be a disciple of Christ where we are? One of the ways that we can do this as we enter this season is to study the disciples of Jesus and look at the scriptures and see what it meant for them to follow Jesus and what his instructions were to them. If I were to ask any of you, who were the disciples of Jesus? I'm guessing you would probably list some of the names that come up in our passage from Matthew today. You'd probably come up with Peter, of course, maybe James and John, Matthew, who wrote the Gospel, perhaps Judas Iscariot, his betrayer. I'm guessing not many of you would come up with Bartholomew or Thaddeus, but for the most part, you would think of these twelve disciples, these men, when you think of the disciples of Jesus. It's worth noting at the outset, though, that these aren't the only disciples. Jesus had many disciples. We learn about them. In the book of Acts, after Judas Iscariot has died after Jesus has resurrected and then ascended. The twelve get together and they call to, well, it's eleven at that point, so they need to, to replace Judas. So they get together and they call anyone who's been with them, it says, from the beginning. And they bring forth Joseph and Matthias. And so we see that there, in addition to the twelve, there are others who have been with Jesus all along. And when we hear stories about Jesus and the disciples... We need to think not just of the twelve, but this larger group. We know of Martha and Mary and Lazarus, who are Jesus' friends, and Mary, who famously was praised for sitting at Jesus' feet among the disciples. We know of other disciples who were in secret, like Joseph of Arimathea, who buried Jesus. We have famous stories of those who were converted, like Nicodemus, The disciples is a large group of people, dozens, even hundreds of followers of Jesus, men and women, young and old, single, families, widows. There's a wide variety of disciples. And it's important for us to keep that in mind as we consider what it means for us to follow Jesus and when we read stories of the disciples. Yet there is something special about these twelve. Jesus has called them out. They are his inner circle of followers. So why? Why out of this vast array of disciples, men and women, young and old, even some Gentiles and Jews, why does Jesus call these twelve? And what is significant about the ministry that he calls him to? I'm going to be with you for the next three weeks. And those three weeks perfectly encompass the calling of the twelve and Jesus' instructions to them. So we're going to have a little mini-sermon series these three weeks, looking at the calling of the Twelve and what that means for us. And we start today with Jesus' calling and consider what is significant about the calling of the Twelve. Before we get any further, though, you probably want to know who I am. So first, a word of greeting. My name's Scott Gorbel. Um, I'm a non-parochial priest in the diocese. It's a fancy way of saying that I'm not employed by a church right now. So I'm not the head rector or an assistant rector. I work in hospice. I was church planning down in Columbus for a few years. Uh, We moved up here for my wife, Katie. My wife and son are here, so you can greet them afterwards. But Katie is a nurse midwife, and we came up here to start a new home birth practice. So I'm following and supporting her right now. In this season, we've made Christ Church West Shore our home, so that's where we regularly attend. I know a lot of you know Christ Church West Shore probably more than I do, have have many years of connection there. And so, first, I want to just start by sending my greetings from Christ Church and from Father Gene. 
He wanted you to know that we are praying for you regularly. Praying that the Lord would increase you, not just in number, but that you would grow in health and be fruitful and faithful to the gospel. And as you are faithful to the gospel, that the Lord would also increase your numbers. We are praying for you. And I'm glad to be here with you. As Father Joshua, I know, has recently left you and taken a new call in New York, and Deacon Mark has gone down to St. John's regularly, I have a feeling you might see more of me. We'll see. As a non-parochial priest, I have more flexibility. So I'd be happy to come back and help from time to time as Sean has need. But it's good to be with you this morning. So thank you for welcoming me, allowing me to serve you and to worship with you as we bring our praises to God together. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open up to Matthew chapter 9 and 10. Or it's in your insert here, and you can follow along as we're going to go deeper into this text and examine Jesus' calling of the twelve. The context comes in the middle of Jesus' ministry. He's already begun. He's done his famous Sermon on the Mount. He's been going around healing and teaching. He's already had his first run-ins with the leaders of the synagogues and the Pharisees who have accused him of being demonic and calling on the forces of demons and evil and he's been uh, challenging them and challenging everyone with his controversial teaching. And so our text picks up in verse 35 of chapter 9. Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, healing every disease and every affliction. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. So why does Jesus call the twelve? Well, the first reason is just a practical one. Jesus is teaching and serving, and as he goes throughout several cities, he's getting these large crowds coming to him to receive his teaching and to be healed. And he looks at them and says, this is more than I can handle. The harvest is plentiful and the workers are few. So he commissions 12 to go out and carry forward his ministry. This is the first place that the 12 are called apostles, and we get that word. The word apostle means sent one. In the ancient world, a leader would have apostles that he would send out to carry his message. So if a king wanted to say something to a city and couldn't or didn't want to go himself, he would send an apostle. And when that apostle read a letter or shared his message, he would have the authority of the king. It was as if the king himself was there in that city declaring the message. And so this is the purpose of the twelve. Jesus gives them his authority so that when they go and proclaim the message and heal, it's as if Jesus himself is there in the city and the town preaching and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom. And we have that same idea of apostolic authority today. That's why we have bishops, if you didn't know that. In the Anglican tradition, we believe that bishops are part of the line of succession of apostles that goes all the way back to the first twelve. So when Jesus commissioned those twelve and sent them out to do ministry, we believe that those twelve further laid hands and gave others apostolic authority. And it went throughout history all the way today to our bishop. And that's why when you all had confirmations, the bishop came and laid hands on you. Because it's as if Jesus himself was here with you, laying hands and commissioning you, giving the authority of Jesus. And so we go out with that same apostolic authority that goes back to the twelve. But why twelve? Right? When I think of a pastor, usually they have a couple of mentors, a couple of close-knit circles that they work with, maybe one or two or a handful. But Jesus commissions 12 apostles. Practically, if it's all about practicality, and he's sending them out to do more work to spread the reach of his ministry, then why didn't he send dozens or hundreds of disciples? Because as I said at the beginning, there were many. It wasn't just the 12. So why pick these 12 men? Well, the number 12 is not random. It might be to us. But in Jesus' day, the number 12 had significance to his hearers. 
the Jewish people. For when the kingdom of Israel was founded, it was founded with 12 tribes. These 12 tribes were named for 12 sons of Jacob. So why is that significant? And why do I think that the number 12 is not just random, but that Jesus is pointing to this fact? It's the language of the passage we get. We don't, it's not that Jesus, Jesus is just proclaiming the gospel, but rather the gospel of the kingdom. In America, we, we don't really like kingdoms, right? We, we kind of rebelled against a king and threw him off. We're a democratic republic, so we don't think of kingdoms. We refer to countries as nations or nation-states. But to the Jewish people of Jesus' day, the word kingdom was loaded with political significance because the kingdom of Israel had collapsed. They were exiled and became refugees. And even though they were back in the land and living in Jerusalem now, they were living under Roman occupation and authority. They had no king to speak of. They were politically oppressed with very little freedom, very little social power or status. If we think our taxes are bad, they were taxed more than half of their income went to the Roman Empire, an empire that was pagan and that was against everything that they believed in. And so when Jesus looks at the crowd and says they are harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd, he's thinking of something very specific here. You see, sheep and shepherd is language going back to the Old Testament that's frequently used to describe the people of Israel as like sheep. And sometimes God is referred to them as a shepherd, but also the kings. The most famous king of Israel, who is he? King David. And what did he do before he became king? He was a shepherd. So when Jesus says the Israelites are like sheep without a shepherd, he's saying that they're without a king, that they're in a state of political collapse, And they're waiting for the kingdom to be restored. There was a long tradition in Jesus' day, going back to the prophets, that one day God would send a Messiah. And that word Messiah is also political. It means king. The people were waiting for God to show up and bring a new king from the line of David, a new shepherd for the sheep, that he would overthrow the Roman government and reestablish the kingdom of Israel. We tend to miss all of this political overtones or undertones and tend to just spiritualize it. But in Jesus' day, the implication of him bringing 12 Jewish men together and giving them authority to preach the gospel of the kingdom would have spoken loud and clear as to what Jesus was doing. He was declaring that he was the Messiah here to reestablish the kingdom of Israel. This helps us make sense out of verses 5 through 7 in chapter 10. It says, These twelve Jesus sent out, instructing them, Go nowhere among the Gentiles, and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and proclaim as you go, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Why not go to the Gentiles or the Samaritans? We know Jesus had a ministry among the Samaritans with the woman at the well. We know, of course, eventually we are the product of the the gospel reaching out to the Gentiles. So why does he send the twelve just to the lost sheep of the house of Israel? It's because the calling of the twelve is not just a practical sign of authority. It's a symbol of who Jesus is and what he's accomplishing. There's a lot that could be said about verses 9 through 15 of our passage today. And I don't, for the sake of time, I'm not going to go into some of these controversial and challenging phrases. But I think at least part of what's going on, as Jesus instructs them to not take anything, to enter a house, to give the house your blessing or take it back if they don't receive you, and finally to shake off the dust of your feet when you leave, and it'll be more bearable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah than for that town. I think at least part of what's going on is a particular type of ministry because of the symbolic nature of what Jesus is doing with the Twelve. These are not universal instructions. Jesus doesn't give these instructions to any of his other disciples. 
And they're not instructions that go for the twelve throughout their whole ministry. But in this particular instance, Jesus is doing something symbolic. By sending the twelve with these instructions, he's calling attention to what he's doing as he declares that he is a king coming to bring a new kingdom. And he's calling Israel to be faithful and to turn and to follow him. And so in this moment, he gives instructions to the twelve as to what they're to do as they continue to go and extend the reach of Jesus' ministry throughout the countryside, going to many towns and many cities, and being the apostles, the sent ones, with Jesus' authority to declare the kingdom of heaven. Ultimately, Jesus' ministry does extend to the Gentiles and the Samaritans and around the whole earth after his resurrection. When he calls the twelve here and gives them authority, he's doing a symbolic gesture, and yet it's not what anyone would have expected. As I said, the people were expecting a Messiah to come and overthrow the Roman Empire and reestablish what we would call the nation-state of Israel, right? And he would set up as king, as opposed to the Roman emperor, and reign over the kingdom. And yet he doesn't do that, does he? And as we see, we we might expect, if that was Jesus' intent, that he would give the, the twelve apostles authority over armies and say, go into the land and throw out the Roman armies. But he doesn't do that. Instead, he gives them authority over the spiritual powers that are afflicting them. He gives them power to heal illnesses and to cast out demons. And he's, he says he called the twelve disciples to them and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every disease and every affliction. Jesus is ushering in a new kingdom, a kingdom of heaven. It's not just about the political, it's about the spiritual Jesus recognizes that the people have a greater affliction than the Roman Empire. Rather, there are spiritual forces at play. They are afflicted with illness and disease and demons, political oppression, social oppression. They are, as he describes, harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. What is the significance of Jesus calling the twelve? It's a symbol that Jesus is establishing a new kingdom on earth, the kingdom of heaven. And this will be a new people, not just the old Israel, but a new people of God who carry out his purpose and his ministry while on earth. And that this kingdom is not just a place in Israel, but it is a spiritual kingdom that exists throughout the world wherever Jesus' apostles are sent to go and proclaim the gospel and carry out his ministry. The kingdom is a place where those who are sick are healed, where those who live in the shadow of the death find hope of a resurrection, where Jesus' gospel is proclaimed and where affliction ends. It is a sign of the world that is going to come at the end of all things. The kingdom of heaven is near to you, here and now. That is the, the message that Jesus is sending out. And he sends it out not only in word, but in deed, by sending out the twelve. So what does all this mean for you and I? Here today, in Lakewood, in Cleveland. I'm curious, how many of you, and you don't actually have to raise your hand, but how many of you when you first heard the gospel, heard any mention of the kingdom of heaven or any mention that Jesus was calling a new people to be the people of God, reestablish Israel as God's kingdom on earth? I would guess not many when you first heard the gospel. The typical gospel presentation that we have in Protestant America goes something like this. God has made us for a relationship with himself. Our sin has broken that relationship and separates us from God and leads to death. God, in his mercy, has offered forgiveness of our sins through Jesus Christ's sacrifice, 
his death and resurrection. And now whoever believes in Jesus shall have reconciliation with God and the promise of eternal life. No mention of kingdom, no mention of a people, no mention of spiritual affliction being ended. Yet these are the messages that dominate Jesus' preaching and teaching in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Now, I'm not saying that that presentation of the gospel is wrong, right? Please don't go back to Father Sean and say, Scott was telling us that the gospel was wrong and false. No, please don't go to the bishop and say that I'm preaching falsely. That gospel is true and good, and I believe it 100%, and I hope that you all do too. But if that's all we hear, and we never hear the gospel of the kingdom as it's described in Matthew, then we run a risk of having an incomplete gospel. And I fear it's one that leads to the individualism that pervades our day. We live in a time where individualism is rampant, even among Christians. And many people are leaving the church. Now, some of those who are leaving the church are becoming atheism and rejecting faith altogether. But many who have left the church still say to be spiritual people. Some even still like Jesus. But they say, I don't like this whole church thing and tradition thing. I'm going to do it my way. Me and Jesus. But if we read the Gospel in Matthew, there's no room for a privatized Gospel of it's just me and Jesus, I'm going to do it my way. Because the Gospel itself is that God is reestablishing the Kingdom and creating a people for Himself. Part of what it means for salvation is not just that I individually am saved, but rather that God is calling me to be part of His people, invited in to do ministry together. Christianity was never meant to be an individual endeavor, but a team effort, a people who come together to represent Jesus on earth, to be His kingdom, And our world desperately needs a people to be the kingdom of heaven among them. We live in a world full of affliction. Many people who are politically and socially oppressed, just as in Jesus' day. People who are afflicted with illnesses. We're living in a time of a mental health crisis. And this started before the pandemic that rocked our world. Each generation for the last three has increased in depression, anxiety, suicidal ideation, isolation, and loneliness. And the pandemic has exasperated all of those things by isolating us from one another. And yet, in this time, individualism still runs rampant. People thinking they can do it their way on their own. I have my truth. The gospel of the kingdom is calling us to be together, to be a new people of God, a reestablished Israel, to proclaim the gospel, to heal affliction of all kinds and spiritual oppression. Jesus said to his disciples in his day, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. This word is as true in our day as it was in Jesus. And he is calling to me and to you, to those who have heard the gospel and accepted and believed in Jesus, to be a people together and to carry forward his ministry to our neighbors who are suffering with all kinds of afflictions to proclaim the gospel of the kingdom. The kingdom of heaven is near. And to proclaim it not only in word, but in deed. Let us pray that he would give us his authority so that we would go forward not just in our own effort, but with his authority to proclaim that word. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for sending Jesus. We thank you for the forgiveness of our sins, which are many. And we are not worthy to carry forward your gospel. But in your mercy, you have 
sent your Son to forgive us, to reconcile us to you and to one another. And you have called us to be a new people and to go forward and proclaim the gospel of the kingdom in word and deed. So empower us with your Holy Spirit. I pray that this community of St. Anselm's in Lakewood, Ohio, would have your blessing of the Holy Spirit to carry forward your ministry and proclaim your gospel. In the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.